Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Certainty Talks. On this show, we talk about certainty, a topic that feels more important today than ever before, but all in all, always an important topic. We have my good friend and business partner in the Whale Club, Paul Sparks, here. He's not only a very successful real estate investor, but also a certified certainty advisor. Now, we do this show because a wise man once asked, if you look at the last three years of your business and took the 12 months that were negative and turned them into zeros, what would happen to your bottom line? And that wise man is Dan Nicholson. Now, we are here to help you achieve financial certainty by rigging the game in your favor. I'm also on a mission to create 100 millionaires. This podcast has enough information alone for you to become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you'll take consistent action, you will become one. And if you get value today, please share this episode right now. That way we can all grow together. Now, as we start talking, we're going to have some open loops here. Be comfortable with open loops. Don't try to close those loops so quickly. You may miss out on some additional information. And uh, let's go ahead and start off today, Paul, with some six-word updates. You want to go first? Sure. So I don't know if you can tell, but I've got a different background today. I, uh, my wife and I just got here to, uh, to Hawaii last night. So got a new scene for the next couple of weeks, which is yeah. awesome. So my six-word update has to do with why I'm here. And it, uh, it's the energy debt must be repaid. Energy debt must be repaid. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, as business owners and entrepreneurs, I mean, in general, right? A lot of us, um, we work hard. I mean, that's part of, part of life, right? Um, we work hard and we expend a lot of energy. And that debt has to get paid back at a certain point. Um, for me, it's always been Hawaii. It's just, just a, such a magical place that my wife and I have come for the last four or five years. And so I come here to recharge. I come here to pay the energy debt back, you know, and it has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. Stop grinding and start sculpting the life that you want. Yeah. What is that view? I can't really see it. That is the Pacific Ocean, my friend. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's not too shabby. Not too shabby. Nope. And you're wearing the, wearing the whale club shirt, so that's definitely appropriate for where you are. We got to, you know, I was saying before we started, you got a free willy. Uh, so my six-word update. Right. Can I commit for 900 days? And that one, you know, I was reading bumpers uh, on the plane. I went to, you know, L.A. Uh, with uh, some of the members from Collective Genius to get an insight into the real estate market. And uh, in reading bumpers, I was like, oh, yeah, we can all commit to anything for 90 days. But can we commit to it for a year? Can we commit to it? the rest of our lives. So I think just adding another zero gives you a different perspective on the question. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a version of the commissioner frame, right? Mm -hmm. Is, is, you know, if we are the commissioner of our, of our own life, of the league, of the, you know, the game that we're playing here, well, we get to decide the rules. I mean, we, we can decide to play or we can decide not to play. And so the real question is, is, well, if I decide to do this, is this something I can, you know, I can play for, for 90 days, for 900 days. And if not, then maybe we better rethink our, our approach to that. I really like that. That's good. Yeah. So uh, today's episode, we're going to be talking about stop grinding, start sculpting. What does that mean? Man, I have this, this, this image of um, a young entrepreneur or a young, you know, business person, or, you know, I was in sales for, for, eight years before I got into this business. And it's just this idea of grinding, grinding away. A lot of people celebrate that as if it's some sort of uh, badge of honor. The rite of passage. Right? Yeah, it's a rite of passage. You have to go through this grind, grind, grind mode. And grinding to me has this, um, well, first of all, grinding and sculpting, they are both ways to sort of remove excess um, and, it's a, and it's a version of chasing more and more and more and more. Um, what we're trying to do, I have this image of this block, you know, of marble and this, this sculptor, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he makes these very deliberate chisels and chips, right? And he's actually removing material to whittle it down into this beautiful sculpture or masterpiece. Um, 
you know, you don't see a big sculptor coming out with this giant grinding wheel and just <laughs> grinding down hammer. at it. Yeah. And so to me, grinding is, is a result of having your head down and not picking it up to see the field. Um, and Dan has a way of talking about this in the CCA. And he says, maybe it was Randy Massengale. I forget exactly who said it, but he says, you want to engage, you want to reflect, and then you want to re-engage. And so this, this idea of grinding, it's this continuous process. Whereas, you know, the alternative would be sculpting where you're, you're, you're engaging, you're making a chip or a chisel. Mm -hmm. You're taking a step back to now look at it. And then you're, so you're reflecting and then you're re-engaging again. Yeah. And so I, I like that concept rather than grinding away at things. Well, there's an expression, right? Especially in sales, right? Like we're in the weeds. When we're in the weeds. We just keep going, right? And you don't know exactly where you are. And if you don't know where you are, you don't know if you're going the right direction. You know, um, a lot of the education and guru industry has a pretty negative connotation. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I've been coaching people for years, right? I've been mentoring for a long, long time. And the greatest benefit in a mentor or a coach is actually not the coach or mentor. There's good benefit there. I'm not discounting that. The greatest benefit of having a mentor or a coach is someone that you have to stop every week, stop everything you're doing. And then we're going to look at what went well in the last week. What didn't go well in the last week? How are we responsible for that? And then on top of that, the thing that didn't go well last week, how can we make sure that doesn't happen again? And the thing that went really well last week, how can we get more, to, more of that? And so, you know, again, I'm not discounting the value of the mentor or coach themselves, but actually one of the greatest benefits of having a mentor or coach is that you have to stop and you have to reflect, right? Otherwise, you just keep going. And you might be going the wrong direction for a long time, and completely miss your target. The example I've heard, right? Like, if you're leaving Guad uh, what was it LaGuardia, right, in New York, and you're going to LAX, if you're off by 1% in the destination, you miss your target by 1,500 miles. So you got to yeah, stop and reflect. One degree is 60 miles or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just crazy. Um, we, we, we say something on my team. My team, if they're listening to this, they'll be like, yeah, Paul says it all the time. We say test and learn not plan and implement. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of a version of naming the puppy. And Dan, Dan tells this story. You, you remember that story of naming the puppy? Mm -hmm. You want to explain that? Well, yeah. I mean, basically, we as entrepreneurs have this tendency to get so fall so much in love with our ideas. And like, we're telling everyone about it, right? Let me tell you about this great idea I'm going to implement. And we're so excited about it that we've basically named the puppy, right? And the idea is, you know, back in the, uh, you're a pet, uh, pet store owner and you know, you've got them when the kids named the puppy, right? If it's like that kid's spike, I think you've got, was it Mr. Pickles, right? Um, that's, that's Dan's dog name. Yeah. Pickles. Yeah. Pickles. Right. So like once you name the dog, you can't bring it back to the pet store or the pound. You can't. You would feel so guilty about it. And so the same thing as, as a business owner, like, I've got this plan. Paul, let me tell you how amazing this plan is. We're going to do this, this, and this. I've already told you in my mind what the revenue is going to be. Right? I already know how much money I'm going to make from it. And I completely discount all the challenges, the efforts, <laughs> the costs, missed opportunities, opportunity costs, and everything else. And I'm so committed to this idea that there's nothing you can do to talk me out of it because I've named the puppy. Right. Yeah. You, you get attached to the outcome. It's like, like you said, that's why these, these, um, that's what we do this in real estate. Think about it on the retail side. We bring someone into a house. We're showing a house. We want to sell this house. And you might say, well, here's where you, you guys can put your couch. Can you imagine having friends and family over and what a beautiful space and you guys could have, uh, you know, holiday meals here and yada, yada, yada. Kids are playing in the backyard. Can't you see this and imagine this? And they're trying to get you to, um, to associate this, you know, oh, yeah. this future state. Once they start identifying where they're going to put the furniture and the kids start picking the rooms, done deal. You've named the puppy. Yeah. And it's going to be much harder 
to go uh, to go back on that again because we've just now become attached to the outcome. Just like if you give a dog a name, well, this this dog's name's Pickles. Well, it's going to be really hard to take Pickles back, right? <laughs> so, so that's the point: is we we don't want to, at least on my team, we try to avoid making these big plans for the future when we don't have enough information. And so we test and learn. And and for in, me, in my mind, how this relates to sculpting versus grinding is grinding is sort of like we've decided what we want so far out in the future before we really have all the data and we really understand what happens. It's kind of like, um, what's that saying? Like 90% of plans fail in war or something like that. But you have to have a plan when mm -hmm. you go into battle. But you got to also know that the plan's likely going to fail. We need to be able to adapt and move as it comes. And that's what I think of when I think of grinding, it's just like head down. I'm not, I'm not paying attention to the new information that's coming in. I'm just, I, I committed to something and by God, I'm someone who says, who does what they say they're going to do without fail every single time. And so then, the risk of that is you, you might miss a more efficient path forward. So then this is not the same thing when we talk about grinding as the context that's normally used in, in at least it seems like in, in wholesaling real estate is I'm in the hustle and grind season. So we're not saying don't hustle and grind. We're saying just come up for air on a regular basis. Correct. Reflect. So you, you got to engage, reflect, re-engage. And, and the concept of grinding is this continuous approach. And all I'm advocating for, like, I understand the term grinding. Right, I understand why people would would want to associate with that. I'm grinding because it's easy to just put your head down. It's much harder to pick your head up and read the terrain, read the field, make a chisel, make a chip, and then take a step back and look and observe. Right? Did I? And then and then maybe go to the other side and maybe go to the you know to a different spot. And so the point is is grinding has this. Uh, as an allure, uh, people feel like, yeah. oh, they want to brag, I'm grinding. Right. Yeah. And so both are ways to remove excess, right? Both are ways to, to remove something from your life, which is, in my mind, the, the way to achieve happiness. Um, in fact, I was, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading while I've, while I've been here. You wouldn't believe it, Steve. I've already read almost two books in the last day and a half because you know, I just finally have more time to read. And I was reading this book called, um, what is it? Uh, I think it's called the art of happiness or something like that. And it says, this was a, a stoic uh, book, Epictetus. Uh, he says, learn to wait and assess instead of always reacting from untrained instinct, instinct. Spontaneity is not a virtue in and of itself. So oftentimes we just get this idea and then we just head down. Like I'm going to barrel through this and mm -hmm. not pick my head up to look around and observe like, and actually, this is a version of the investor frame. Knowing what I know now, after now that I've made this chip, knowing what I know now, would I continue to opt into this current situation? But if you're grinding and your head's down and you can't see the field, you're not taking all the information in, you're likely not asking yourself that question often enough to course correct. Because like you said, one degree off can send you so far off into the other way. Yeah. You've got to practice and build that into your daily routine. I would say daily routine to say, does this still make sense? Is what I'm doing now still getting me closer or am I just grinding away? Yeah. And it sounds so obvious, right? When we talk about it, but the reality is a lot of us will make decisions and we'll grind it out. Like we got, we'll suffer through it, you know, like uh, direct mail, maybe not the best example, but like, if I said, hey, you know, we're going to do direct mail, I wouldn't direct mail for 12 months without once evaluating the results, right? Like, I would evaluate the results monthly, at least, right? But maybe I'd do it more often. Maybe we do it weekly. Um, but we have this idea, like, we're going to suffer through this. And, you know, when you're talking about stop grinding and start sculpting, because I didn't, you know, haven't heard this concept uh, at least presented in this way. I was kind of thinking one of the other things we do a lot, and I'm learning this this year about myself, um, is I have a tendency to just suffer through things, right? Like, oh, I will make it work. 
I'll suffer through it. You actually made the comment when we jumped on. Man, you got a busy day today. It's like, yeah, I'm going to suffer through this. And then I look at Jason Lewis, another person in the Whale Club, and he and I, right, have the same mentors. We're both, you know, giant Darren Hardy fanboys. And one of the th things that we struggle with is um, one of the things we want to be more of is productive, right? And one of the things to be more productive, actually, is to do fewer things. I do not do fewer things. <laughs> Let's be clear here. But I had to send, I had to schedule something with him on Calendly, and I clicked on it. And I was like, Jason literally has so many time slots available for the next few days. What is up with this? And I sent him a text message. I was like, I am envious of this. He's like, Yeah, I'm doing my best to, you know, <laughs> implement what we're learning. So, well, it, it feels good to be busy, mm -hmm. you know, and humans are hardwired that way. It feels good to be busy. Um, and man, this was something that I really learned from Nick and Dan, which is we just need the next thing to go right. We just need the next thing to go right. We don't have to define steps three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. But we want to do that. And our default is to just go bury our head and start grinding away. Because again, we feel productive. Yeah. Well, I mean, so case in point here, right? You and I, we talk every Sunday. And uh, one of the things we're talking about is like, what is the next thing that can happen that can really make a big difference? Well, we can tokenize a real estate fund. That's the, if we get that, we're going the right direction. Well, we got great news in the past week. Pete Kavanaugh in the Whale Club is moving forward with tokenizing his real estate fund, right? Two funds. Two funds. So that's huge, right? For uh, for what we're trying to do as far as you know, closing the gap between real estate and blockchain and other emerging, emerging technologies, right? Which is the mission statement of the Whale Club. So that's the next thing that has to go right. So that's that's happening. We got to make sure he finishes it, right? We got to support him in finishing it. But then, what's the next thing that has to go right? Finding the secondary market, so that he can start selling his tokens, so he can start pulling cash out in his fund, right? So we're not talking about, hey, we're going to create the secondary market. We're going to go compete against T zero. We're not going to go create this other platform or this technology. We're like, what is the next thing that has to go right? And and trying to figure out what's the next thing that has to go right goes back to the principle of stop grinding and start sculpting. We just got to pick our heads up and figure out what's the next thing that has to go right. Mm -hmm. How do you think this ties in with Dr. Jeff's? Because everybody has, language is a funny thing. Everybody has, some people will say grinding, grinding, I'm grinding away, grinding at this. And they don't, they don't see it as anything negative. And I'm not saying that it necessarily is negative. I'm just saying there's a better way to do it, which mm -hmm. is sculpting, yeah. right? It's, it's taking pause. And, and Dr. Jeff describes this term called soft offense. Mm -hmm. The way I understand soft offense is sort of like how we play Jenga. You know, imagine this, a big adult, you know, Jenga situation. And well, if you're playing Jenga, you don't just go up and just like mash one of them. Mm -hmm. You go up and you kind of poke on this one, you poke on that one, like, and you see which one gives, right? And you're like, ah, okay, that's the one that's, that's going to give. And you pull that one out. Yeah. You don't just go in and barrel in and just poke, you know, push, push one all the way through. That concept of lightly pressing on different opportunities mm -hmm. to see which one gives, in my mind, is another kind of way to articulate the language of sculpting rather than grinding well i mean i think i've talked about it on this on this show right i'm i do kung fu right so you know martial arts something i'm passionate about um and one of the things we do in kung fu is we never go for the knockout blow until it's obvious it's the not time for the knockout blow right so all we're going to do is we're going to keep jabbing keep testing the defenses and in the moment there's an opening right and we're saying like it's a guaranteed hit this is not like if i go for it i might hit him it's like once we have like 100% certainty, this is a knockout blow, then we go for the knockout blow. And until then, we're just constantly testing the defenses, see what's available, see where the weakness is. We're going to keep testing the defenses, right? It's kind of like, you know, if you're looking at like a, a sci-fi movie, right? They can keep testing the probes. Let's see, let's see where the weakness is in the shield. But once we find the weakness in the shield, 
we're gonna blow it up. Or I guess the other one I would look at is you know Le'Veon Bell before he went insane, right? The guy was the absolute best at waiting for the defense to set, and once the defense was set, then he killed it. But he kept testing, figure out where the opening was, and once the opening was there, then he hit the hole hard. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's like avoiding the all or nothing thinking is is yeah. sort of another way to say that. So let me ask you this, Steve, because um, you've been in this business so much, so much longer than me, and you've you've coached and worked with so many different young business owners, and I've found myself violating this grinding aspect. Mm -hmm. But where have you observed real estate investors grinding when they when they should be sculpting? You know, it's fascinating. Actually, just we had the show, you know, earlier, and it was with the Bokley brothers, right? And I actually. Uh, we talked on a call about potentially working together as a mentor-mentee situation. And as I was talking to them, I was talking to them about their business. I was like, okay, so you guys are doing really well financially. You guys are doing really well in your flips. Um, and you guys are running a business with almost no expenses in marketing. Um, why are you talking to me? Right? Like, why do you want me to mentor you? You already have a successful business. I don't understand why we're talking. Right? And the reality was they were just chasing more. Right? They had a business. It was, they were doing, you know, uh, not 10 houses a month, but like five houses a month, which in flipping, five houses a month, flipping five houses a month consistently is really hard. Right? It's not like. And I've seen the deals month. that they do. They're, they're big deals, right? These yeah. are Las Vegas million dollar and up kind of deals. Yeah. So they're doing five deals a month with no overhead, right? Because they're just buying off the MLS. Like, why are you talking to me? And they said that on that call, because we just talked about it. They're like, why are we talking to Steve? Because they never stopped to think about it. They just thought, I got to do the next thing. I got to add. I got to scale. I got to grow, right? Or, you know, when we first, when I first became licensed, it was just obvious, like, after you become licensed for three years, the next logical thing is to become a broker and open a brokerage. Thank God. No, actually, no, I still made that mistake. But most people <laughs> still make that mistake. It's like, here's the next thing. Here's the next logical thing. Here's the next logical thing. But we don't stop and take a deep breath and, like, look up, look around, you know, uh, survey the, the, the landscapes. Like, oh, am I doing the right thing? And going back to the investor friend, knowing what I know now, would I opt into this again? Probably not. Well, and, and, it, and I just love how all these things come full circle and you can see them in so many different areas. It's just such a definition of, it's such a, well, it's such a good example, case in point, you could say, for just the human condition. We are hardwired. And we've got it. We probably said this on every single show we've done so far. Yeah. But we are hardwired to chase more and more and more. It's back to the woolly mammoth stuff. Right. We never we didn't know when our next opportunity was going to come. So we were always maximizing for everything. And so this tendency of, well, how do I grow my business? We're not saying that's a bad thing. What we are saying is, what is this what is the sculpture of your life that you're trying to actually get closer to? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it has less to do with doing more and more to do with removing excess, right? So um, that's, a great, that's a great example. Somebody that just, you know, it's like, well, hey, do you really want to do more flips? Do you really want to grow a bigger business? Or like, what are you trying to get closer to? Are you trying to have more time to start other businesses? Maybe yeah. you love doing flipping and you do want to grow from, from five to some, you know, to 10 or whatever a month. The point is, is just like, do you have clarity around why you're trying to do that? What's the currency you're mm -hmm. getting more of? Is yeah. that at attention? Is that time? Is that money? Is that energy? All the things that we talk about in time or so. Yeah, it's, it's really easy to get caught in that trap of grinding away. I've done it. I've done it for years. Yeah. It's well, only even, recently that I realized it. Even uh, over the weekend, right? Uh, I, I got a chance to hang out with Phil Green down in LA. And uh, we were talking a few months ago. You know, he's a big time operator in, in the San Diego area. We were talking a few months early. He's like, hey, I'm thinking about expanding to, to Phoenix. What are your thoughts on that? I was like, uh, I'm not excited about competing against you. I mean, be honest with that. <laughs> he's like, no, we'll do it together. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll partner up, do stuff together. It's like, okay, I'm excited about those prospects, right? <laughs> but what's he doing? He's just constantly evaluating. Like, do I want to do this? 
you know, with the way, with my, the way my business is today, am I satisfied? Do I want to do things differently? Do I want to mix yeah. things up? And after reflection, which is what he does a great job of, is, you know what? I'm not going to expand to another market. I'm just going to go deeper into San Diego. But he's actively thinking about it, right? He's yeah. called, I mean, when he called me, he's like, tell me about the Phoenix market. You know, what's the uh, market like? Who's the, who's the big guys? What uh, kind of deal volume? You know, what's the average fee? Like, he's asking all these questions. And the reason why he, is he's evaluating his next step. And there's, there's a reason why he's wildly successful is because he's doing that on a regular basis. Yeah. And I think what you find as you get higher up and, you know, the more I've hung out with you and other people from Collective Genius, and you start to realize that sculpting requires a massive amount of clarity. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... And it's also okay. I reserve the right to change my mind as well. So it's this, it's this odd kind of like checks and balances system. Like you have to have clarity on what it is that you really want more of. And I think of that as the currencies. We talked about timer. And actually I've sort of, uh, I've included one of Joe Polish's uh, attention. And I think Larry Yatch is a big fan of, of attention mm -hmm. as well. So I, I've started saying it's a timer instead of just timer. So the A is for attention, right? But sculpting requires massive amounts of clarity on one hand, but we also have to recognize that the, the sculpture that we originally thought may not be the thing that, that it ends up being as we get closer and closer and closer. But if you're just grinding away with this vision of what it was going to be, because the reality is, is there's so much going on in the world. And as we think that we know everything, but we don't, we don't have all the information. We're making decisions as best we can based off as much information as we have right now. Right. But, th but that changes. And there's also, right. When we're making decisions, there's like, there's what we know, right. Which is great. There's what we know that we don't know. It's like, okay, well, here's some variables that we're not prepared for, but like, you know, we'll, we'll conquer as we get there. And it's so that what we don't know that we don't know, like the unknown unknowns and we're making decisions while they're unknown unknowns. It would be um, malpractice, right? It would be grossly irresponsible for us to commit to something when we collect new data. So we're talking about stop grinding, start sculpting. So for someone who's listening, like how do they practice this, this principle? You know, this is where I think if, if you don't have, and we, we obviously it's a little self-serving to talk about the operating system because mm -hmm. we have that and that's what we talk about in the whale club. Yeah. However, before I learned any of this, I was just grinding away at things. I would decide, hey, I'm going to do this. I would put my head down and I would just go and go and go and go and go. And most of us that are um, high achievers, let's just say, oftentimes we, we are successful at that, but it doesn't necessarily get us closer to the things that we want. But it's like, but we have this ego about us that, well, I said I was going to do it. And I'm someone who says that you know, does what they say they're going to do. So I'm going to do it. But absence an operating system, if you don't have things to kind of like check your understanding, it, it's, it's, it's pretty aimless. That's how I felt for a while. And so one of the frames that, in fact, it's, you know, the, the topic uh, or the, the title of my podcast it's called the investor frame. And this is something we learned from Dan Nicholson, our mentor. And um, I'm, I'm really glad that I learned this when I learned it because I was building business that didn't exactly serve me. Um, and so, like you said, we've said this a few times, but what the investor frame says is that knowing what I know now, would I still choose to opt into this current situation? So it's a way to avoid the naming the puppy sort of thing. Yeah, you might have decided yesterday that this was a really good idea, but today it's no longer a good idea. But but it's like the Jenga game, you mm -hmm. know? But it's like, but that's the one I want to get. So you just come and you barrel in it. It's like, but that's not how you play Jenga. Right. You know, you, you, you've got to press on things. And yeah, that one might have been loose before, but it's not now. Well, let's talk about case in points, right? Like you were a flipper and i use that in the past tense yeah yes were <laughs> <laughs> so right 
I still say successful real estate investor. There's no doubt about that, right? And you still do massive deals, but you're no longer a flipper, but you were a flipper. So how did this concept play there? Well, you know, I think I think I did a, a little bit of this at the beginning. Um, it was more intuitive than it was uh, an operating system or a good way to make decisions. But um, in my first year, and I think I actually said this when I came on your podcast, is like I pressed a lot of buttons. Um, I needed to I needed to see what happened when I pressed this button. I needed to see what happened when I pressed that button. Um, and I pressed the flipping button. I pressed the wholesaling button. I pressed the retail button and the innovation button and the larger development button. And I did this because I wanted to see what happened. I wanted to get some information back. Do I like this? Do I not like this? Well, I started doing some flips. I didn't really like it, but I was like, well, but I'm already doing it. So I started doing another flip and I think I did four or five flips in my first year. Um, I should have stopped at number two because I had enough information at that point to be able to say like, you're not very good at this. Like you don't have the relationships down yet. You don't have the processes down yet. You're just doing it to keep up with everybody else because everybody else has figured out how to flip. You are like, well, by God, I'm going to figure out how to flip. Like this is not going to beat me. But if I had been honest with myself and I had, if I had used the investor frame, knowing what I know now, would you choose to flip again? Would you choose to buy these flips again? Hell no, I would have not done that. Yeah. Um, and so it's easy to violate these things and to see it in hindsight. It's much, much harder to, to recognize it right when you're in the middle of it. Yeah, well, I mean, same like you, right? Like intuitively, I knew. Because um, I flipped. I hated it every single time, right? And I, there's a couple things that go against me. Uh, one, right. I, I have an engineer brain, so engineer brains and creativity do not go hand in hand, right? You don't have an eyeball necessarily for flipping if you're an engineer, right? I think white, I think white painted walls are beautiful, right? That's who I am. B, I have to manage more people in order to be a successful flipper. And so have to be, be uh, have to, uh, have a better eye, have to be able to manage more people and C, it takes longer. Like none of these things are exciting to me. So I just made a decision after a couple of plus, like this sucks. <laughs> this is not me, but I made a decision. I didn't continue going down. I was like, well, you know, flippers make a lot of money. I'm going to keep flipping. I just looked at it. And some people say like, I took the easy way out. Well, I'm sleeping pretty good. Right. Right. Well, and you chipped that, you chipped that part away. Yeah. Right. We're able to, instead of just keep grinding away and let's just do more and more flips till we can figure it out. Now, there's a, there's a case to be made for working through things to get what you want, right? But when you say, well, man, this requires me to manage a bunch of people and geez, these, the cash conversion cycle on this is huge. And geez, like I'm, a, I'm stressed dealing with these deals. Like there's just a lot of, of stress that you want to, you know, carry here. And so again, Resources are limited. This is another version of Dan. Of Dan, I can hear Dan probably chiming in in the background saying, "Like resources are scarce. We need to recapture and reallocate those things, right? Because you can now recapture all the energy you were spending on that flip and reallocate it to something that actually gets you closer to what you want, which might be, you know, we we talked about, you know, I don't think it's a. We were sort of joking before we got on, we started, we hit record today, right? About how we like to press buttons. We just mm -hmm. like to press buttons. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I like to try things and do things. I'm not apologizing for that anymore. What I'm doing is I'm building my life and my businesses so that I can press buttons. <laughs> I like to play business for a sport. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just curious. I'm like, I want to see what happens when I press this thing, you know? Um, it's really, really hard to, to run, a, to have your life uh, set up that way and to play business as a sport like that. If all your businesses are taking up all your time and you're grinding away, right? Business is something for me that I realized like, I'm not gonna retire like, because I play business for a sport. That's what I do for fun. Mm -hmm. So how can I design my life so that I can play business as a sport. If something takes up all my time, my energy, my attention, 
my money in a lot of cases. I've lost money on plenty of business ventures, right? Um, if it if it's taking and sucking all that away from me and doesn't allow me to play business as a sport, it's not something I'm interested in. And I need to test it, engage with it quickly, and then reflect and say, does this actually serve me? The investor frame. So that's really the mechanism yeah. is you apply the investor frame daily if possible. Weekly is probably sufficient. But if you can ask yourself, well, knowing what I know now, does it still make sense to do this? Is it, is it going to help me get closer to the things that I actually want? If not, then get rid of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a couple of things here. First, these are the kind of things that we talk about inside the Whale Club, right? So if, you get, if this sounds like something that might be of interest, you know, join our community, uh, blockchainwhales.com, join our Discord, and you can have conversations like this with other people inside the Whale Club. That's the first thing. Second thing, some of the most successful people in my life have dedicated thinking time, right? So uh, Ryan Pineda, great friend of mine. And you know what his top two activities are? Thinking time and creating content. Those are top two activities, right? Like how incredible is that? So he's been able to achieve a lot of what he's done by having thinking time. And what are we talking about here? Stop grinding all the time and just grind, think, and then grind some more if if you're so inclined, right? But, you know, we don't have to suffer. And that's one of the things, that, like I said, I learned this year. So another great book about this concept is the book, The Road, uh, the, the Road Less Stupid, written by Keith Cunningham. And the guy was living a really good life, a great life in the 80s. He felt like he was the smartest person in the country. He's figured things out. And then interest rates change, not unlike today, and everything went to crap, right? And he went back and evaluated every decision he ever made that cost him his entire fortune and more and wrote an entire book of questions to just ask yourself, right? So thinking time is another way of saying, you know, like uh, stop grinding and start scale, uh, start sculpting is thinking time is, is so valuable to growing a business the right way that's consistent with what you want and getting you closer to what you want in life. Well, if you don't take that time, the thinking time, um, it's, it's sort of like, again, I just imagine this sculptor who's just like, got this big grinding wheel and just like nah, 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 all over <laughs> trying to make it all in one go. That's just not how it works. Just picture like, Michelangelo with that. Yeah. Like that's just that, that's crazy. And that, but, but everybody's in such a rush to get where they're going mm -hmm. that they think that by just applying this continuous grind, that's the best way to do it. And honestly, Steve, this is why I'm here in Hawaii. Right. And that's why my six word update is the energy debt must be repaid. It's another way of saying sometimes you need to step back. Sometimes pressing, you know, we're in a weird spot in the market right now. Um, and I'm going on vacation, right? I'm going to just, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to look at things. I'm going to take some time to get my mind off of things, to get clear on what it is that I really want before we make a big push into 2023. I tell my team all the time, 2023 is going to be our breakout year. Um, so you have to repay the energy debt. You have to take a step back and look at the whole picture and say like, well, what is it that I really want? And if you don't take time to do that, you run the risk of, of grinding away and getting further from the things that you actually want. Yeah. And I think the other thing too, just to add to that, because I just read bumpers, right? This last weekend is once you've identified what you want, now you can identify your non-negotiables. Yeah. And once you identify your non-negotiables, it's a lot easier to get you living the life that you want, right? So uh, you can start, again, sculpting instead of grinding. If you have your non-negotiables, it's a lot easier to sculpt. Yeah, and I also think that oftentimes, one other point just I want to make is I think oftentimes we confuse the tools that we're using to get closer to the things that we want with our actual identity. So we identify as a real estate investor when it's like, that's just the tool you're using to get the things that you want in life, to become the person that you want to be. Stop. It's, it's a means to an end, yep. right? I, I am, I am not a real estate investor in, in 
you know, my entirety. Yes, I use real estate investing to get the things that I want. And, and you might, yes, in certain circles, I'm not saying you can't identify as a real estate investor. All I'm trying to say is don't confuse the tool with the end goal. The end goal is not to become necessarily a real estate investor. It's that might be a tool that you're using to get the things that you want in life, but don't confuse the tool with the means, with the actual end goal. Yeah. And if you were, ask, if you were to ask my five-year-old daughter, right, I am a YouTuber and a Will Club employee. I got a good laugh out of that. That was pretty funny. Um, any last messages we want to leave everyone with? Um, the, the way to the, the real takeaway here is what we call the investor frame. So if you want to stop grinding and start sculpting your life, it starts with clarity, but you have to give yourself grace to adjust as you go. So, so find a way. If you're not going to use our certainty operating system, which I highly suggest you do because we learned how to do this from some of the, you know, some of our mentors, let's just say, and we put this into practice. I didn't have this. I didn't have the language to put to it. Once you have the language, things are like, oh, right. The investor frame, knowing what I know now, would I choose to do the things that I'm doing? Would I choose to opt in? Because we always have a choice. Every time we continue staying in something, we are opting in and we have the choice to opt out at any point in time. But if you, if you are grinding away, it's probably the result of you not picking your head up enough to look and say, is this actually serving me and helping me get closer to the things that I want? Um, so ask yourself that as often as possible, um, knowing what I know now, what I choose to opt into my current situation. Yeah. And, you know, we had Larry Yatch on the show and he's someone also that I, I had as a mentor, right? The Navy SEAL. He talks about if you don't have time to plan, what that means is you need to spend more time planning. So for this year, we're talking about, you know, if you don't have enough time to think, to sit down and start sculpting, maybe you need to slow down, stop grinding so much and sculpt a little bit more so that you do have more time to sculpt effectively. Yep. So cool we'll wrap up here. Hope you're not suffering too much in Hawaii. It looks like you're having a really rough day over there. So we'll, I'll just suffer over here in Phoenix. Keep grinding over here. <laughs> Take time to sculpt, Steve. <laughs> I'll see you next week. All right, man. See ya.